Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfectionalis one more time, where medicine just makes perfect sense. Today we will continue our discussion on bronchial asthma, diagnosis and treatment, so let's get started. I'm not gonna repeat myself, you can watch my previous video if you wanna learn more about asthma. Let's jump ahead to the diagnosis. When you first see a patient, first ask yourself, what is the severity? And the severity of asthma is divided like this. We have intermittent asthma, which is less severe. And then we have persistent asthma, which is more severe. And persistent has three subtypes. There is mild, there is moderate, and there is severe persistent asthma. So one of, of those four, intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, or severe persistent asthma. Okay, this is the first question, the severity. Next, focus on control of symptoms and response to treatment. First, you diagnose the patient, you determine the severity, you started him on medications. Then you switch the medications or you increase the dose based on the control of symptoms and response to treatment. You can do skin tests for allergens. It's positive in extrinsic asthma because this is the one related to allergy. Intrinsic asthma has nothing to do with allergy. Okay, and this is gonna help you probably narrow down your differential of what allergen triggered this asthma. Pulmonary function test, if, if it's done during the attacks, and this is theoretical. If you have a patient during an asthma attack, oh, let's go to the pulmonary function lab to get some pulmonary, no, shut up, shut up. And when you do it and the patient is normal, not in the middle of the attack, usually the PFTs are normal. So all of this is just some academic exercise. Spirometry obstructive pattern because asthma is obstructive lung disease we have four obstructive lung disease we have bronchial asthma we have chronic bronchitis we have emphysema and we have bronchiectasis bronchitis and emphysema together are called copd but it has to be chronic bronchitis so asthma is obstructive therefore you see obstructive pattern what do you mean by obstructive pattern i mean the patient cannot get the air out Therefore, there is air trapping with increased residual volume and increased total lung capacity. If you want to know what's a residual volume and what's a total lung capacity, watch my previous videos on pulmonary function tests in this glorious playlist called Pulmonology. There is low FEV1 to FVC ratio. Yes, because this is an obstructive lung disease. Next, you diagnose obstruct. Your next step is to determine the severity. And you determine the severity by looking at the FEV1 alone, not the FEV1 FVC ratio. DLCO, which is diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide. Early asthma, it's very mild, so normal DLCO. Late or severe cases, there is revascularization. When there is revascularization, there is more blood vessels, there is more red blood cells, there is more hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has heme and globin, and heme and globin and heme has iron and protoporphyrin as you know if you have more hemoglobin you will have more hemoglobin to bind the carbon monoxide that's why you have increased diffusion capacity of carbon monoxide because no, now we have more hemoglobin next we can do flow volume loop not to be confused with pressure volume loop those are two separate things you will see obstructive pattern You'll see coving, decrease peak expiratory flow rate, and quite normal inspiratory limb. So it looks like this. If this is normal, and we have discussed this before in my video called Flow Volume Loop. In brief, here is your normal curve. Let's inspire, guys. And let's expire. This is normal. Let's talk about asthma here. Let's start with inspiration. Okay. It's normal. Why? Because the problem in obstructive lung disease is not in getting the air in, it's getting the air out. So during expiration, there is the problem. Now you'll see the problem. Look at this. So decrease the peak. Look at the peak here. It's very high. This peak is lower. And then there is coving, which is like caving, as if the curve is like afraid or something. And this is bronchial asthma, baby. Is the inspiration curve like 100% normal? No, it's slightly decreased. But it's not the same as the expiration. Expiration is the main issue here. But this curve probably will not differentiate between asthma and COPD because both of them are obstructive lung diseases. By the way, to be like um, very uh, sophisticated and clear, sometimes if there is air trapping, this curve will hit here and then hit here because now it has to increase the lung volume because there is increased 
residual volume and therefore increase total lung capacity. All right, this new curve is not gonna tell you is this patient COPD or is it asthma? So how would you tell the difference, sweetheart? You give bronchodilators. If you find a huge response like this and improvement thanks to bronchodilator, the, the peak increased and the coving disappeared, this is asthma. If it didn't change or very, very, very slight change, this is COPD because asthma is reversible. COPD is fixed obstruction. Let's talk about arterial blood gas. Early, the patient is tachypneic. <laughs> His respiratory muscles are still healthy, man. This is gonna lead to respiratory alkalosis because he's washing out the CO2 and CO2 is acid thanks to the carbonic anhydrase equation because CO2, if you add just some water to it and add some carbonic anhydrase to anhydrate the CO2 or remove the water, it's gonna lead to H2CO3. This is called what? Carbonic acid. So CO2 is an acid. When you lose the CO2, you're losing the acid, you end up with alkalosis. And this is going to lead to increased pH. Later, there is respiratory fatigue, severe asthma. The patient has been hyperventilating and tachypneic for a long time. Now it's time to stop. It's time to get fatigued. This will lead to hypoventilation and respiratory acidosis because the CO2 is being trapped in. And this is going to lead to low pH. So, if it's early, you should expect high pH. If you start to see normal pH or even, God forbid, low pH, it's bad news. You might say, oh, the pH is normal. Must be the patient is improving. Shut up. The patient is worsening because you want him to be tachypneic because at least you know that his muscles and his respiration is a little healthy. But if there is respiratory fatigue and he's like this, <gasps> He's very close to respiratory failure, doofus. Be very careful when the pH of an asthma patient start to normalize or even drop. And maybe it's time to intubate and mechanically ventilate. You can see hypoxia, low P small AO2 and hypercapnia, high P small A CO2. Methacholine challenge test, also known as bronchoprovocation test. Methacholine is a parasympathomimetic. It works like parasympathetic. Sympathetic is fight or flight. I'm running from the tiger. I should dilate my bronchi to breathe in more. Parasympathetic is the opposite. It constricts your bronchi. So methacholine is a cholinergic agonist. So it works exactly like acetylcholine. Why do you give this to a patient with asthma? Do you want him to die? No, no, no. I just want him to be diagnosed. So we put him in the lab. You cannot do this in your in your office or in your clinic. No, no, no. It has to be in a specialized lab because really the bronchoconstriction could be severe and then it's an emergency case. And then you should like rescue the patient. So only do it in a specialized lab. You give methacholine. You can give histamine or cold air. We call it thermal. Well, I thought the thermal means heat. Yeah, it's related to heat because cold means absence of heat. It's just physics, man. Come on. When do you give methacholine challenged. If the patient has normal spirometry, because if the spirometry is diagnostic, uh, why bother with the methacholine challenge test? Plus one of the following. Chronic cough, intermittent cough, unexplained exertional dyspnea. Okay, we got it. We do this methacholine challenge test. How do you know if this patient has asthma? Okay, if you give me a normal person Methacholine, do you think my FEV1 is going to be normal or decrease? Of course it's going to be decrease, but slightly decrease. Like 3%, 5%, 7%, but an asthma patient, it has to be 20% or greater for you to make a formal diagnosis. By the way, what's the name of the receptor which constricts the bronchi? Is it nicotinic or muscarinic? And the answer is it's muscarinic. Is it M1, M2, or M3? And the answer is M3. On the other hand, what is the receptor that dilates your bronchi? Beta or alpha? And the answer is beta. Is it 1, 2, or 3? The answer is 2. M3 receptor is GQ coupled, works through phospholipase C, IP3, increased calcium, and protein kinase C. Everything is C or 3 because C is the third letter in the alphabet and 3 is the third number. Beta 2 is G-S coupled. Everything is going to be A. Adenylcyclase 
ATP into cyclic AMP, leading to protein kinase A. Hey, I can now breathe. To learn more about M3 and beta 2, watch my video called Respiratory Pharmacology in this great playlist of pulmonology. Some serum tests to diagnose asthma. You can find eosinophilia, and we have talked about this in pathogenesis in the previous video. Or you can do a biopsy. Do we do it? No, rarely done. But if you do it, you will find this. Bronchial biopsy. Basement membrane thickening. Submucosal gland hypertrophy. Those are the glands that secrete the mucus, man. Mixed inflammatory infiltrate and edema. Smooth muscle hypertrophy. Bronchial biopsy. This is, I'm sorry, not bronchial, bronchiolar. Basement membrane thickening. Major basic protein, okay, which comes from eosinophils, which are recruited by interleukin-5, which is secreted from macrophages, especially lung macrophages. All right, and this will lead to shedding of epithelial cell, forming Kirschman spirals, which are spiral-shaped mucus plugs. You can use your search engine to watch some pictures about this. Crystalline granules in eosinophils, they coalesce, leading to charcoal-laden crystals in the sputum of asthmatics. Airway remodeling, smooth muscle hypertrophy, hyperplasia, then fibrosis. Goblet cell metaplasia. Normally, those bronchioles have no goblet cell whatsoever, but in asthma, there is metaplasia, and you will find goblet cell in the bronchiole, and this is not normal, but these goblet cells will secrete mucus. That's why a patient with asthma has a clinical triad of cough, wheezing, shorts of breath, and mucus production. And you can find loss of epithelial cells in a patchy pattern due to those crazy macrophages and eosinophils. Here is the most important slide in this freaking video, and it drives students absolutely bananas, but it's so easy. We have two main types of asthma. We're talking about severity here. Intermittent or persistent. And then we divide persistent into three subtypes. Mild, moderate, and severe. Okay, we got it. Okay, based on what? It's not like the doctor's whims or biases. No, there are guidelines. When you see this, you diagnose the patient with this. When you see this, you diagnose the patient with this. If you left it to doctor's opinions, uh, God help you. Intermittent, it means the patient has symptoms less or equal to two days every week. And he can use short-acting beta agonists such as albuterol for control. And you prescribe it to the patient as needed and he only needs it like two days a week, two times per week. Okay, nighttime awakening. How many times do you wake up coughing and wheezing? Less than two times per month. FEV1 or peak expiratory flow rate or PEFR, it's usually greater than or equal 80%. Okay, which is still good. Activity impairment or limitation, none. Can you go to work every day? Yes, sir. Treat via step one treatment. What do you mean by step one? We'll discuss this in an, the next slide. Just, just be patient, man. Next, mild persistent asthma. Why? Why do you say that? More than two days per week of symptoms. Use of short-acting beta agonist as needed, and the patient needs it more than two days per week, but not daily. And then nighttime awakening three to four times per month. FEV1, it's going to be still greater than or equal 80 percent impairment minor impairment and treat via step two as we will discuss later moderately persistent symptoms are daily every day i have wheezing or cough shorts of breath slash mucus stuff like that use of short acting beta agonist for control more than once a week but not nightly wheezing at night is not good news it means that this asthma is moderate or maybe severe Nighttime awakening more than once per week, but not nightly. FEV1 between 60% and 80%. Activity impairment, there is some limitation and treat using step 3. Severe persistent asthma. Symptoms are throughout the day, every day. And in every way, I'm getting wheezing, cough, shorts of breath, and some mucus. Use of short-acting beta agonist seven times a week, every day, doctor. Nighttime, every day, doctor. And then FEV1 is, of course, less than 80%. And then there is extremely limited capability during daily activities and treat using step 4 or 5. 
How to manage the patient with asthma? First, initial evaluation. When you first see the patient, think of severity. Is it intermittent, mild persistent, moderate persistent, or severely persistent? So initiation therapy depends on the severity. Continuing the therapy depends on the control of symptoms and response to treatment. Intermittent as well as mild persistent usually are well controlled with treatment via step one or step two. If the patient is well controlled and he is happy with the medication, maintain the current therapy. Don't overthink it. Moderate persistent, use step three. If not well controlled, step up one step and then reevaluate the patient in two to six weeks. Severely persistent asthma, use step four and five in treatment. If not well controlled, you may give oral, not inhaled, oral corticosteroids. Step up one or two steps and reevaluate in two weeks instead of two to six weeks. Pharmacological treatment is divided into quick relief, which is also known as rescue therapy, or long term control. Quick relief include use for asthma, acute exacerbation, and mild or intermittent disease. And but the long term is used for persistent asthma. Short term includes short acting beta agonists such as albuterol, oral steroids such as prednisone, anticholinergic or muscarinic antagonists such as ipratropium. Long term include long acting beta agonists, salmoterol for moterol, inhaled steroids such as budesonide. You asked me about the steps of treatment of asthma, and I've told you to wait. Good things happen to those who wait. Steps to treat asthma, here's the preferred therapy, and you have some alternative, just like we don't need the guidelines to be very stiff, like a male copulatory organ in the pre-orgasmic phase. So we will give you some flexibility and some room to move and think for yourself, because you're a human being and you went to medical school, so supposedly you know something about health. Okay, step one. Step one is for patient with intermittent asthma. You give short acting beta agonists such as albuterol as needed, also known as PRN. When you see PRN in medicine, it means as needed. You prescribe it to the patient, please, sir or madam, take it when needed. Step two is for people with mild persistent asthma. You give low dose inhaled corticosteroids such as budesonide. You have some alternatives. You have other options such as leukotriene receptor inhibitor, the famous Montelocast and theophylline and i've talked about theophylline in my video on respiratory pharmacology in this playlist about pulmonology please don't forget that montelocast or any drug related to leukotriene are used in asthma but have no place whatsoever in copd because copd has nothing to do with leukotrienes so why give a leukotriene receptor inhibitor if the pathophysiology of the disease does not involve leukotrienes doofus Step three is for patients with moderate persistent asthma. You give low dose inhaled corticosteroids and long acting beta agonists, or you can give medium dose inhaled corticosteroids. Here is a pearl for you. Never, ever, 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 ever give long acting beta agonists alone. They are never used as monotherapy. Always combine them with low dose or medium dose or whatever inhaled corticosteroids. So long acting beta agonists has to be given with inhaled corticosteroids okay it's a must low dose inhaled corticosteroids plus one of the following as an alternative you can combine it with theophylline with leukotriene receptor antagonist or with xylutin step four man is for severe persistent asthma medium dose inhaled corticosteroids plus long acting BAMs. don't use laba alone always combine it with inhaled corticosteroids you have some alternatives such as medium dose and one of the following theophylline, blah, 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 montelocast, and xylutin. Step five. Step five is for who? Severe persistent asthma. High dose inhaled corticosteroids plus long acting beta agonist, and you can add omalizumab if the asthma is related for IgE. Translation if it's an extrinsic asthma and not an intrinsic asthma. If a patient has exercise-induced asthma, it's not related to allergy or to IgE. If you give omalizumab to a patient with exercise-induced asthma, you're what's known as wrong. Step six, which is not 6C at all. This is a very severe asthma when the bleep hits the fan. High dose inhaled corticosteroid plus long acting beta agonists plus oral corticosteroids so you're using inhaled and oral steroids at the same time in the same patient you might consider omalizumab if it's an extrinsic asthma translation related to ige and atopy okay let's talk about exercise induced asthma please remember this is intrinsic asthma translation it's not an allergy it's not related to ige 
So don't say, oh, I give Omar Lee's a map. Shut up. Okay, how to manage this exercise in Duzet? You can do something before the patient exercises, or you can do it when the patient exercises and gets short of breath. So, prophylaxis. Before you exercise, sir, I want you to take short-acting beta agonist about 15 to 30 minutes prior to exercise. And they can last you for about 2 to 4 hours, something like that. Thank you, doctor. Also remember to warm up before exercise. I forgot to take the prophylactic therapy and now I'm short of breath and I'm wheezing after exercising. Okay, we will treat you with warm, moist air plus short-acting beta agonist. Management of status asthmaticus. That's an emergency, baby. The patient has to go to the ER. Not in your office, not in his house, not on his couch, and for sure as heck, not in his mother's basement. Has to go to the ER. We'll give him short-acting beta agonists because they are short-acting and they will work so fast because it's an emergency, man. You give one treatment and then wait for 20 minutes and then re-administer the drug. Again, short-acting beta agonists such as albuterol. If there is moderate exacerbation, add oxygen and add oral corticosteroids. If severe, add a protropium to the short-acting. If there is respiratory failure, we have to intubate and mechanically ventilate and this is happening in the ICU. We'll take him from the ER to the ICU. Again, not in his mother's basement. But I would like to manage all of my patients on the phone. Shut up. Let's talk about intubation in asthma patients. Usually asthma have hyperventilation, especially early on. This will lead to mild hypoxemia, hypocapnia, and respiratory alkalosis. But then later, when it becomes severe, there's hypoventilation. They might show normal capnia or hypercapnia, and this is bad news. Whenever the alkalosis start normalizing and becoming acidosis, that's bad news. We will need to intubate, and we can use non-invasive ventilatory support. So, in general, there are three main ways to give oxygen to a patient. Number one is oxygen mask, all right, on the top of his face. And as you see in the movies with this oxygen tank or with any source of oxygen, this is the oxygen mask. Number two, again, oxygen mask, but in this time, it's connected to the machine. And this machine will force air into the patient's lung against his will. But he has to sign the paperwork. And this is called CPAP or BiPAP to force the oxygen in. In the first case, the patient was doing the heavy lifting, was actually breathing in, <gasps> taking the oxygen off the mask himself. <sighs> okay, but in the second case, the machine is actually forcing the air into his lungs. All right. And there is a third way, and this is to intubate and mechanically ventilate. You put it in a machine called a mechanically ventilator, and the patient is intubated. As you see, we introduce a tube in his nose or in his mouth into tracheal tube and it goes into his lung and then the ventilator can just shove oxygen in and we can control the rate we can control the tidal volume so and inspiratory volumes and other stuff so we're talking here about intubation and mechanical ventilation first we can use non-invasive ventilatory support this is ventilation without the intubation but then if it's not improving we have to put him on a mechanical ventilator and use intubation. Here is a very important thing for you to remember. Once a patient is intubated, please do not ventilate too rapidly because some of you are so excited. Oh, oh, first time to see a mechanical ventilator. Let's just shove all the oxygen in, man. Let's save patients' lives. Shut up. Hippocrates said, rule number one is to do no harm. Why not just ventilate too rapidly? I want to just like go home and save patients' lives as much as I can. Okay. Asthma patients have obstructive lung disease. We get it. They cannot get the air out. Okay. Therefore, they need time to exhale. That's why when you put a stethoscope on a chest of a patient with obstructive lung disease, there is a prolonged expiratory phase. <gasps> They need time because they cannot get the air out. If you ventilate too rapidly like this, <laughs> like you're pumping a tire, stupid, this will lead to air trapping even more and more and more. This will lead to something called breath stacking. You're stacking air on top of air in the patient's lung, and we call this O2 peep. O2 means self. 
and PAPE means positive end expiratory pressure. Normally, your pressure in your pleura should be negative because if it's negative, it's going to suck air in. That's how you breathe. But if you are stacking air on top of air on top of air, the pressure is going to be positive. We call it positive end expiratory pressure. But since this is done not by our choice, but by the doctor's stupidity, we call this O2 PEEP because O2 means self. The PEEP was created by the patient's lung. That's why we call it O2. But indeed, it was because his doctor is stupid. Like, let's be honest. It's called positive end expiratory pressure. You know what's happened when there is positive end expiratory pressure? There is decreased venous return because the negative intrapleural pressure back in the good old days used to suck the blood up in the veins. <sighs> now there is no negative, there is positive. The venous blood is going to stagnate and there is decreased venous return. This is going to lead to first ankle edema because of the increased hydrostatic pressure and there is decreased cardiac output leading to decreased tissue perfusion. Your doctor was a moron. Forgive my language. The high pressure can lead to barotrauma. Baro means pressure. It's trauma due to pressure and tension pneumothorax. Your doctor was a fill in the blank. Do not ventilate too quickly. Instead, use a technique of permissive hypercapnia. Some of you get excited. Okay, this patient has lots of PCO2 in his blood. He is hypercapnic. He is acidotic. He could be resp has respiratory failure na right now, and I I, I just want to help. I just want to like uh, cure this hypercapnia once and for all. Let's shove this oxygen in, man. No, no, no. Don't do this. Okay, just calm down. Use something called permissive hypercapnia. You mean you you want me to to just like let the hypercapnia? Yes, just let it be. Okay, but don't let it get out of control. So if the PCO2 rise a little, just chill your butt down and do not increase the rate. Maintain, here is an objective goal for you, the oxygen saturation at 90% or higher and do not panic about PaCO2 even if it reaches 80. Do you know what's the normal PCO2 in the arterial blood? And the answer is 40. Oh, you mean I, I will leave it 50 and then increase into 60 and 70 and 80 and do nothing? Yes. Yes. You do nothing. You just wait. As long as the oxygen saturation is normal. But, 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 but this is hypercapnia. Rule number one is to do no harm. You want to end up with tension pneumothorax, baby? And barotrauma? And decreased cardiac output and decreased tissue perfusion? And shock? So shut up and stop it. The moral of the story is, when you intubate a patient with asthma, use a low rate, small tidal volume, high inspiratory flow, and use the technique of permissive hypercapnia. I know it's hard, but just use it. Why do these things? Because these criteria will allow for a prolonged expiratory phase because the patient needs the prolonged expiratory phase to get the air out, lest O2 peep should occur. Thank you for watching. Subscribe, smash like, hit the bell to get notified. Follow me on Facebook. I have more than 100 cases there. You can get my premium videos, my cases, my post notes organized in Dropbox folders, including the slides of this video at patreon.com slash medicosis. Thank you so much for watching. As always, be safe, stay happy, and study hard. Until next time, this is Medicosis Perfectionals, where medicine makes perfect sense.